Hello, my name's Keith. Welcome back for some more Shed Talk. Um, this episode is something that I looked up today. I wanted to do a lesson on how the design of a sprocket um, can affect the forces on it and also how it may or may not affect the overall lifespan um, or fatigue limit of that sprocket depending on what material it's made from. And it isn't my uh, analysis, it's an analysis I came across today just because I was looking at sprockets, different types of sprockets, materials, grades, that sort of thing. And I find it really interesting. So I'll go through it um, and hopefully you'll find it as interesting as I did. But I have, I mean, it is quite obvious when we look at a chain and a sprocket where we feel that the forces will be applied to. And we can only have to really look at the chain and the sprocket to get an idea of where them stresses are going to appear. Um, but how much does material removal affect the sprocket and what are the forces on those teeth really and what are the best type of sprockets? Everyone's got their favourites. I don't think there's an answer to that really. I think it all depends on what you want to do. People start talking about rotational mass, losing a bit of weight here, a bit of weight there. You know, unless you're doing track days every day, how much does it matter? So really, I just wanted to have a quick look at that, run through a Von Mies diagram that I found online um, that I thought was quite cool, thought was quite interesting. Um, the So the formula, so we've got um, the uh, back tension, so the back tension against the force onto a sprocket. So the formula is here, if I just draw a tooth or something like that anyway there we go so we've got a driving force and we've got a back tension a back tension is just resisting the force um, that's being applied it's a resistance to deform. It's being pulled one way and it's, I don't want to go that way, you know, it's got to have an equal and opposite reaction. But also you do need to know what the um, back tension should be. Not that we need to set that, but in designing the sprocket. So TK is your back tension. T0, I'll put the, the figures up on the screen just very quickly so we can go through them. T0 is your uh, chain tension which I think is um, set uh, for the purpose of this experiment anyway, it was somewhere uh, 6572.68 newtons of force. So when they've done this, when they've done this experiment using the von Mies uh, diagram, they've obviously input this into the software um, to give a rough idea of the forces that are applied to the sprocket, obviously under static load as well. So um, phi, so sine phi, um, so that um, sine phi is, so that's the minimum, that's the minimum sprocket um, pressure angle. So that's the, if you like, the angle of attack. So the minimum sprocket, um, just, I'll put the diagram up on the screen, but if you can imagine, it's the minimum angle of attack. So if, if, rub that out, it's the minimum angle of attack on the sprocket. So if that angle, uh, if that angle theta, so we'll call that theta, um, the angle's up on the screen, I think it's about 15, 15 degrees or something like that. If that angle of attack is reduced, so that pressure angle, then instead of the drive coming in on this angle, if we reduce it, then we're starting to, anything past that, we're starting to put pressure on this uh, top part of the tooth. 
So if we put in, if we reduce this angle, we start to pull on this part of the tooth. Well, naturally, on a tooth, there's less material here than there is on this bottom part. So we want to keep that at the optimum angle. Okay, anything less than that, and we start to, well, effectively. Put pressure on there. So if we look at, so that's the minimum pressure angles. That's what this sine phi, and that's the Greek letter phi. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's phi is just a Greek letter that they use as beta, alpha, delta, phi. So the, the next thing we've got is the number of teeth. So N in the calculation is number of teeth. I don't need to write that down. We've got two beta. Um, which is the sprocket sprocket tooth angle. So sprocket tooth angle. Um, and that's calculated by uh, 360 divided by N. N is the number of teeth. In this instance, N becomes 45. That gives us 8 degrees. Okay, and all that is, is if you take some teeth on a gear, um, if we just pop something in there and in there, and then we've got this in the centre of the, the gear, sprocket, sorry, I keep saying gear, um, that there is uh, the sprocket tooth angle. Of eight degrees. Okay. So we need to think about, or in their study, they, they, they've obviously thought a lot about cyclic loading. We need to think about cyclic loading when we design a sprocket. Um, I've messed about in SolidWorks with this and designed some sprockets, and you can do stress analysis in there and, and that sort of thing, but um, Cyclic loading is basically loading on and off, so as you accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, decelerate. But in other things, there's cyclic loading everywhere. If you're pulling a trailer, you've got the acceleration, the deceleration of the car. You've got the undulations in the road. Um, so there's that compression when you brake, and there's that tensile force when you accelerate. And then obviously as you're driving along, you've got this force. You go around a corner, you've got lateral longitudinal forces. There's all sorts of forces that come into play. And that's really what fatigue is. Fatigue within metals, unless there's an obvious fracture or an obvious machining mark or a crack or a propagation or something, unless there's something obvious, very often fatigue happens inside a material. And we don't know it's happening until it's too late. You get something called striations inside the material, which are basically like beaching marks. And when the material fails, you can almost see, we call them beaching marks because it looks like as the tide comes in and goes out and it leaves the lines in the sand, you get them inside materials because it's from the stress and the, and the cyclic loading. And you get this, um, gen generally, then what before a material fails, it will fail at the point where there might just be a small scratch or there might be a little nick in the frame or there might be a dent in something or there might be a machining mark from when it was originally machined. A machine inputs its own fatigue or can put its own fatigue on um, components anyway, depending on whether the right coolant was used or got, did it get a bit hot or even just in the general machining process. So it's something I'm quite enthusiastic about. Um, but fatigue for me, uh, it's, 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 it's quite a, I mean, I won't go on roller coasters. Sad as I am, I've, I've never been on a roller coaster. Um, I may have been on one when I was younger, just some little thing. But as an engineer, I, I mean, I get in a plane, no problem. I go on a plane, train, cars, no problem. Because they're checked, because they're overhauled. And of course, roller coasters are checked. You know, people go around, don't they? they check the bolts, they check this, they check that, they check the structural steel, they check this. But I'm just not into roller coasters for all them different forces. And I just sometimes think, mm, yeah, it's not for me. And it's completely against my engineering judgment, really, because I know they're safe. I know they're checked. 
but in my mind there's a lot of bolts there's a lot of tensile stress going on there there's a lot of compression there's a lot of shear force there's a lot of stuff happening so don't want to put you off roller coasters you know but um, not for me so before we move on very quickly what we'll do is we'll have a look at uh, what is Young's modulus because you need to know what Young's modulus is if we're going to talk about sprockets what is Young's modulus? So Young's modulus. Um, what is Poisson's ratio? And what is density? Now, those three things are very, very important in the design of a sprocket, as I've found out. Not that I design sprockets, but you know, as an engineer, I like to uh, investigate things and have a knowledge of things. So these things are pretty important when it comes to sprocket design. In fact, they're important with any design. Young's modulus exists in all materials. Um, Poisson's ratio and density, you know, density is, is also something that exists as well. So Young's modulus is basically how stiff a material is. It's a material's sort of want to not deform if you like it's a measure of how stiff a material is um how, how, how kind of um its ability to withstand deformation um so if you look on the chart that i've just put up on the screen um young's modulus although that chart looks really scary and really ooh intricate and mathy and it's not it's really really simple basically you've got strain against stress as the strain increases, the stress on the material increases, and they're proportional to each other. So, if you look at the line of, uh, if you look at the angle, if you look at the line as it goes up, you've got a little sort of bit like that, and then it goes like that, and then it drops off. Well, anything, as as you can see on the chart, the this line. Is where things start to happen inside the material at a molecular level on an atomic level so the crystalline structure of that material will start to change um, and strain hardening occurs and hardening basically that means that the material can become hard but change it can become it's, it's crystalline amorphous structure just can alter and if you think about it it's like if you imagine you get an elastic band, okay? Imagine an elastic band is a piece of steel. Imagine it's steel. So you pull it and it stretches and you let it go and it'll go back. Steel does the same, but on a very, very small level, okay? Steel isn't like a piece of chewing gum, but there will be an allowable measure, if you like, and that's what's called the Young's modulus. It's or it's un, it's got also it's it's an ultimate tensile strength. So once you get past its tensile strength, once you get past its limit, it gives up. It's like ugh, can't hold on anymore, because everything wants to hold on. You know, if you try and pull, the tensile force is a stretching force, if you like. So it's the pulling force, and if you pull on this pen, it will allow me to put a certain amount of force on. And I'll keep putting a force on, and inside there'll be things happening to that material, and I'll let go, and it's fine. But when I get past the point of no return, the ultimate tensile strength of that material, that's when things start to fail. And Young's modulus is just a material's ability to withstand that deformation, its ability to be stiff, if you like, and not deform. But even steel has elastic regions, elastic limits. And that's the same with everything so when we're applying that pressure to a sprocket is that sprocket changing its shape is it changing its size is any part of it moving does the amplitude and the frequency and the vibrations of us going down the road affect it well it does and it moves and it changes and Poisson's ratio is I'll put that on the screen as well Poisson's ratio is um if you look at the green area, the green area is the unloaded area. 
on the unlo on the unloaded area it's just it's it, it's 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 happy with itself it's not been put in any, any lateral or axial axial strain so that area that you can see which is the red area is when that tensile or that strain if you like is being applied whether it's lateral axial it's a strain so the difference between the two the unloaded and the loaded is what we call Poisson's ratio so that area that ratio of change is Poisson's ratio and there's an allowable area of change as well that falls within materials and density just to finish off density is best way to describe density is if I was to hold a sponge in my hand and a block, uh, 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 let's just say, I don't know, a sponge and a lump of lead of the same size. By volume, okay, the sponge has a lot of air in it and there's a lot of, not, not a lot of material there by volume, not a lot of mass, matter. So the more matter, the more stuff that you cram into that area, they're the same area, the more stuff, the more matter that you cram in, the more dense that material becomes. So, if you take a volume of area and we put in a few bits of matter, then it's dense, it won't be very dense. There's not a lot there, there's not a lot of matter, it's quite light. But if you take that block of lead that's the same volume of area, but then it's so much more dense because there's so much more matter in there, it becomes packed to the point where it's very dense. And all of that matter is crammed into that same area by volume. And another way to look at it is like this workshop or this shed, should I say, it's just got me in it. So this area by volume contains me and the matter that I'm made up of. Um, if we take everybody on my estate and we, it's going to get messy, cram them all in here, this shed becomes very, very dense because the area of volume, area per volume of this shed is rammed full with people, with matter. So all of a sudden it's a very, very dense area uh, by volume. So it's, 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 that's what density is. It's the amount of matter crammed into the same space. And we can take various materials of the same size, volume, whatever, and all of them can be different densities. And why is density important with a sprocket? Well, rotational mass starts to come into play. So you've got a weight, you've got a mass, you've got density, you've got that sprocket and this rotational mass. People talk about rotational mass and they say, well, I'm going to change the pitch of the sprocket and reduce its size and its pitch and I'm going to get less I've got less material now. I've got to change the other sprocket in the chain as well. But yeah, I've got I've got less rotational mass. Well, rotational mass is it really is negligible on on a on a sprocket um, down the road, like riding down the road. Rotational mass. People talk about it. If you're doing track days and you're trying to lose weight here, there, and everywhere as much weight as you can, yeah, okay, you know, it is a thing, rotational mass exists, of course it does, but does it really matter on the road outside? I get on my bike, I just want to go for a ride to the beach, or I want to go for a ride out with my mates, you're not getting your knee down, you're not doing speeds where your rotational mass comes into play, so much so that you're gaining a tenth of a second on the last lap past Tesco's, it's, um, it's 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 relevant in in other areas you know we're not talking about moto gp here we're just talking about sprockets so we won't we won't digress so we'll look at the first we'll look at the first um diagram uh, i'll get that up on the screen so as you can see on the diagram there we've got the von mise um it's it's the it's a deformation plot so it's showing you where the forces are on those first 10 teeth and that's what's interesting because this formula tells us that, and, 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 and the von Mies diagram tells us that it's only really the first 10 teeth. And if you look at the chart, it's only the first 10 teeth where really where the forces are worth worrying about. You can see tooth one, 
it's got a great greater force than to 10 and it decreases so they, what what they sort of come to the um using this this particular this is mild uh, this is a steel by the way steel sprocket but what the conclusion they've come to here is that anything after tooth 10 the forces are really not worth talking about and if you look at the diagram you can see that the uh, stress the stress on the uh, sprocket so the stresses that we're talking about here what we, what what has been worked out equate to uh, 179 mega pascals and of course mega pascals is what the young's modulus is of that material is um, measured in so it's actually it's actually found that the maximum value of stress is less than the yield stress of the mild steel so that's acceptable so in working that out they can actually say well yeah okay the young's modulus the yield stress of the steel is this this now shows us what the forces are the the maximum forces are on on that sprocket on those teeth and it's equated to 179 megapascals so it has it has a, what we call a factor of safety which is greater than one in this case uh, factor of safety is built into everything um, we don't design things engineers don't design I say we I've never manufactured and designed a sprocket I teach engineers I'm not going to claim fame on that but engineers don't design things to fail um, or you'd like to think they don't you'd like to think they don't um, in this case obviously they don't this is a factor of safety great um, factor of safety greater than one now factor of safety is with everything if you sit on a chair it's designed to take your weight it has a weight limit but it's also got a factor of safety the same with a bridge if you accidentally drive over a bridge in a lorry and you've realized that limit on that bridge was I don't know three ton I've just gone over in a five ton truck there's a factor of safety built in because otherwise if you drive over a bridge in a three and a half ton van or whatever the bridge is going to fail and that can't be allowed so there is an allowable factor of safety and that isn't saying that you should just go ahead and crack on over a weight limit bridge just because you think there's a factor of safety built in um, so but it, it also tells us the maximum deformation so without material removed from the steel sprocket without any material any fancy designs or any of that weight reduction put in what is the difference between the two well this sprocket is saying that the deformation obta obtained in the calculation was uh, I've got it there on the screen it is 0 0.018311831 1, millimeters that's without the material removed which is incredibly small incredibly small um, but that occurs when only occurs when the um, when the sprocket is subjected to maximum force so that's at the point of maximum force so it isn't even a tenth of a mil it's not half a mil you know it's not half a mil it's not a tenth of a mil it's really small so there is movement there of course but it's really small let's look at the uh, picture with uh, with the material removed of the sprocket with the material removed so now we have another uh, deformation plot and this one is with the material removed and um, there's obviously going to be removed for weight reduction obviously sprocket design if you can remove weight um, in their design and they all do we've, you, you, pretty much every sprocket you look at has had weight removed um, but it's how much can you remove what's the what's the benefit of it is it worth it and you know it wouldn't be worth it because otherwise they wouldn't have designed it there wouldn't be sprockets out there for sale now um, but this is really just interesting to look at and this sprocket at maximum force the deformation at this sprocket was 0 0564 um, millimeters and um, the stress on that was 169 megapascals so we've got an increased movement we've got an increased deformation of the sprocket and we've got an increased load um, but you know the modified design even the modified 
uh, design with the with the with the weight removers under the safety limit. So you know um, that that design is a, a, a successful weight reduction, and that's kind of the process that they go through with the sprockets using maybe not von well yeah I assume they would use von mice but um, it, it's it's all calculated it's all it's a really exact science the safety factors are built in. Um, so what what also comes into play here with the modified sprocket is or not with not with just the modified sprocket sorry is is um with the high speeds and the rotational um high speeds you get a lot of vibration um and you get um you know natural frequencies that occur as it's rotating and those are recorded in um obviously the gigahertz figure um, a frequency so we this this study compared the frequencies between the two and it was actually quite interesting because even though there was more movement um, in terms of when the when the forces were greatest even though there was more sorry not movement there was more deformation even though there was more deformation and even though the forces were slightly greater on the sprocket what was interesting was with the material removed from the sprocket they actually it actually had less natural frequencies so less vibration now i say that's interesting you might think well that's obvious but not necessarily um you could often imagine with material removed or you, you couldn't you can imagine with material removed it something might become less rigid but actually in this case because it's a fixed um, on the test of fixed sprocket but also under testing as well those natural frequencies were less for the modified design um, so the the modified sprockets response to those natural frequencies were better so it may be I mean the 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 the, the deformation is neg uh, negligible anyway so if this is well within limits, and this is well within limits of the ultimate tensile strength of that material, and removing material from the sprocket doesn't really affect that much, depending on how much you remove, obviously, and it reduces the natural frequencies and natural vibrations, then I can understand why they do it, if not just for weight reduction, but also increased performance. So I thought it was a really interesting um, study that was done there um, the, the design of the of the of the second sprocket um, has been basically successfully optimized with weight reduction and with less natural frequencies anyway thanks for coming back to the shed thanks for listening to me harp on about sprockets and boring you to death with this lot we'll see you soon <laughs>